we'll move on to uh, toward more equitable and student-centered participation evaluations from Ashley Kennard, Assistant Professor of Communications at Ohio Wesleyan University. Great, thank you. Let me get my screen here. Awesome, all right. So, um, hi, Ashley Kennard, Professor in the Department of Communication at Ohio Wesleyan. Um, and today we're gonna talk about more equitable and student-centered um, ways to think about our participation evaluations um, or our participation grades that are often in a lot of our syllabi. Um, before I get started, I am not currently um, on Ohio Wesleyan's campus, but I do want to acknowledge that Ohio Wesleyan is located in Delaware, Ohio, which is a city inside of Delaware County. Um, and both the city and the county were named after the Anglo name that was given to the Lenni Lenape indigenous peoples who were removed from their homeland in the east um, near what the colonists called the Delaware River. Um, the university resides on land that was originally inhabited by Iro um, Iroquois group of Native Americans, primarily the Seneca and the Cayuga and some Susquehannock people who were forcibly removed west from present day New York by European colonists. Um, I also want to, <laughs> I added this slide because I was going to give this presentation from my apartment um, where Barkley also resides. And I wanted to let you know that that was who was barking if you heard him um, because they're doing construction outside of my apartment and he seems to be triggered by that. Uh, but I actually had to move locations because of the construction that they're doing. My electricity was cut off. Um, yeah, <laughs> just, just shortly ago uh, around two o'clock. Um, and I also wanna acknowledge, I did miss Marie's presentation because of that. And I wanna recognize that we're talking about some of the same things so there might be some overlap in what she presented. Um, so my apologies for that. So just to sort of give you an overview of what I've prepared um, for our conversation today, and I'm gonna go through um, everything I have, and then as we've been doing, sort of open it up to conversation and dialogue about it. Um, but first, we just wanna talk about uh, our standard participation evaluation practices and what those currently look like in a lot of um, places. I want to recognize that not everyone is obviously doing the same thing, but there seems to be in conversations that I've had with peers and with students that we're doing a lot of it in the same ways. And then I want to talk about uh, some more equitable and student-centered approaches um, that you can consider adopting for your classes. And those are to create rubrics specific to participation evaluation, um, to grade participation multiple times throughout the semester. So we'll talk about that. Um, we'll look at getting students to participate in self-grading, which I understand is what Marie um, talked about as well. And then last, getting those rubrics created in collaboration with our students. And so in thinking about participation, and I think I'm drawing on, you know, my own experience in school um, for all of those years and how I was evaluated. And then I just sort of adopted that same practice. And it seems like we kind of all do it in some ways. Um, we know that participation is linked to greater learning outcomes. This is well established and so it is meaningful, it's worthwhile. And I think we also like to include it as professors because it encourages students to motivate, or I'm sorry, it motivates students to engage, right, with the class more. Um, there was a study done in 2013 that looked at how often instructors um, include participation as part of their final grade, and they found that 75% of instructors include participation as part of the final grade. Um, so this is something that is happening across um, a range of disciplines in a lot of the classrooms on campus. Um, but we also know that these things are often tacked on at the end of the semester. Um, I actually reached out to a student who recently graduated just out of curiosity um, on her experience. And she mentioned that she could think of one professor in her four years at the university who didn't just grade participation subjectively at the end of the semester. Um, and these are also vulnerable to instructor bias. And so that got me thinking about how can we sort of rethink participation as a communication scholar, um, I recognize the importance of engaging students in dialogue um, and trying to think about ways to strategically uh, include them in this process. 
And so I sort of started coming up with some of these questions. And first of all, we have to ask, how are we operationalizing participation? So what is it exactly that we're grading when we say we're grading participation? Um, are we looking just at attendance? Was the student there? Were they physically present? Do they then get points for being there? Um, or are we counting vocal contributions made during class discussion, um, which is problematic in a number of ways. So one is just that it's cumbersome, right? To constantly trying to keep track of how many contributions um, a student has made during a certain class period, but also it doesn't take into account any non-vocal contributions that students might be making. Um, another thing we wanna ask about is what is it rooted in? So this idea of participation, where does that come from and what um, sort of spheres are influencing what we think of when we think of participation? And so are there differing intercultural limitations or expectations um, that we're laying out and sort of rooting all of this in. And then the last question is thinking about who is assessing participation in the classroom. So how is it being evaluated and by whom? Um, specifically, is it instructors or student um, assessments or also having peer assessments of student participation, um, which has been shown to, to still be rooted in the same biases that instructors might have um, when they're evaluating participation. And so trying to come up with more equitable um, student-centered approach to participation evaluation, I sort of came up with these four things that I've been doing. Um, and I certainly wanna get through these and then open it up for conversation or suggestion. If anybody's doing other things, um, those ideas are absolutely welcome. Uh, and those four things just again are creating rubrics, grading multiple times throughout the semester, um, having students participate in self-grading, and then also creating those rubrics in collaboration with the student. Um, and I'm just gonna go through each of these and talk about a few of the things that I've noticed and learned in my own experience, um, and maybe a little bit about directions that I'm wanting to take it in. And so the first, again, creating rubrics. And I think at the minimum, when it comes to participation, it's imperative to provide students with clear cut and explicit guidelines for participation. Um, in so many of my own personal experiences in the classroom, professors just have this arbitrary number of points that your participation is worth, and then you get assigned a certain number of points at the end. Um, also, in my experience as an instructor in the classroom, students tend to expect to get all of those points. Um, if they showed up every day for class, they just kind of come into it expecting I'm going to get 100 participation, um, and they're upset when they don't. Right. And so I think that having a rubric is a really important way to set those guidelines at the front of the class and make sure that students understand what is expected of them in order to earn a certain number of points. It provides transparency. It reduces some of the bias. Of course, as we talked about earlier during the keynote, every evaluation is subjective, but we can reduce some of that bias. Um, it also sets expectations for the students so they understand what they need to be doing, and it creates these attainable goals that students can sort of set their sights on. Um, and for creating the rubric, I also recommend, in addition to just having that numerical sort of explanation of where points are coming from or how it's being calculated, I think it's important to include explicit descriptions of what you perceive per participation to look like and to provide students with certain examples. And so, Things to include in that description, you might consider what is meant by participation. Does it involve any listening? Does it involve asking questions? Um, so a lot of times students think about participation as just their contributions, but also being active and asking questions. Does it involve helping others? So if another student um, has a query or is having trouble understanding, is this a way that I can earn participation credit? Um, also, how will unhelpful or unrelated comments be evaluated? So should those be included in our evaluation of participation? And then finally, are there any non-vocal options or ways to contribute to the class discussion? Um, and that last one I've really been thinking a lot about. I will say I've introduced it in a few of my classrooms that were particularly sort of seminar structured and really discussion heavy. Um, and while I haven't had a lot of students using the non-vocal options, um, which have been as simple as just emailing me their thoughts at the end of a class or asking questions before class, 
um, that I can bring up anonymously. Um, for the one to two students that are using these resources, it's really made a big difference. Um, and so just having that option available and making sure that students understand that that is an option for them. And so here is just an example of what a rubric might look like. I'll admit, I just pulled this off of the internet and I don't actually have a source because I found it in several places. So it seems to be one that um, a number of, of instructors and faculty are using, um, but it provides that at the very least, like I said, that bare minimum sort of baseline of explaining to students, this is why um, you're getting assigned the grade that you're getting assigned. And it really defines here too, like what that strong contributor is and how that's different than someone who maybe just shows up every day um, or maybe makes a comment or a single question every now and then. Um, and so creating rubrics, bare minimum, I think that's a great place to start. The next thing is creating multiple times throughout the semester in which you're evaluating participation. Um, and so this one is when you evaluate it multiple times throughout the semester, you're really allowing the students that opportunity to make adjustments. Um, and so it eliminates that surprise. I didn't do this perfectly um, because you're giving feedback as the semester is going along and it removes any sort of ambiguity. And so if I say vocal contributions are how I'm evaluating your participation, um, I want to make sure that the students understand what I mean by vocal contributions. Um, and so it gives them that opportunity to ask questions. It also keeps their participation salient, right? So it's something that's gonna stay on their mind throughout the semester. If we're evaluating it multiple times, they're gonna continue to think more about it and perhaps be more motivated to become, if they haven't been engaged or stay engaged um, throughout the semester. And then finally, it allows students to ask questions. And so they can get that direct um, sort of immediate clarification on anything that they might not understand. And so um, creating rubrics, grading multiple times throughout the semester. And I will just say one more thing about that. Um, so, so far, I've actually, it overlaps with actually my third point. I've not divided up their grade. Um, instead, we assess where they're at with participation throughout the semester. Um, and that all sort of culminates into their final participation grade. And so it's not necessarily a cumulative because that doesn't really take into account their adjustments. Um, and so I wanna see that they're adjusting throughout the semester. Um, and so maybe they had a very bad first couple of weeks, but they came around or they slowly got more comfortable with the class and I don't want them to get um, sort of deemed for that. Uh, and so the third thing here is that students participate in self-grading. Um, and so introducing that rubric that you come up with at the beginning of the semester so that students have a sense of how they're going to be evaluated and then have them fill out that rubric and rate themselves. Um, and as I was just saying, having them do that multiple times throughout the semester to keep it salient, to keep them aware of what um, is being assessed and how they're being evaluated. And then including a requirement that they also write a reflection. So again, it's not a matter of just adding in or, or filling in those numeric values for what we think about, um, but asking students to reflect on why they think that they've earned a, the grade that um, they, they have indicated on that form. And so, especially if it's at the midpoint in the semester, then ask them to also establish a plan. So what are you hoping and wanting to do going forward? Um, and I think, Megan, that kind of provides an opportunity now to reevaluate how can we look at some of those executive function um, aspects uh, to this whole equation, right? And so that takes me to the last point, which is creating rubrics in collaboration with the students. And this is a part that is a little bit more, um, it's not something I've done yet in the classroom, um, but it's an idea that I've been sort of stewing on. And so inviting students to aid in the creation of the participation rubric at the beginning of the semester. Um, and so having students work collaboratively to have their voice and their input in what they think um, active and meaningful participation looks like. And so coming up again with question, what constitutes good or excellent classroom participation? Um, what is participation in a lecture heavy class? What does that look like if it's not a seminar or a lab setting where students are more actively engaged? Um, and then what can someone do if they don't feel comfortable contributing verbally to the in-class discussions? 
Uh, and so again, this is putting it all in the hands of the students to sort of decide what makes the most sense in terms of ways to um, contribute to the classroom environment and the discussion that's happening, uh, maybe without speaking directly in class. And so just to recap, participation is important for student outcomes. That's well established. We also, we tend to grade or have the participation element to our grade to motivate students to participate, but it's very vulnerable to the biases. And so um, those four steps that I've been working on to make more equitable and student-centered um, participation evaluations are to create rubrics, grade multiple times throughout the semester, have students participate in self-grading, and then also creating those rubrics in collaboration with the students so that they have a voice in what is being assessed. Um, thank you so much for your time. Here's my email address. I can put that in the chat for you as well. And I'm just curious if anyone has any questions, comments, or concerns. Thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm intrigued in, uh, in comparing your presentation with Marie Snipes's. Uh, and uh, we did consider uh, putting you in the same uh, session. We, uh, we chose not to uh, because we wanted to create a little more opportunity for people just to think about participation in the schedule. And it turns out to be good that I didn't put you at the one o'clock, <laughs> at the two o'clock block as you lost power. Um, I, I think I'd characterize hers as, uh, her approach as being uh, more narrative than is communicated to me with the uh, rubric based approach, uh, which I think is, is interesting, although it's questionnaire based. So it's still a bunch of very specific things for students to think through. We have a question in the chat from Ayana. I use the term engagement now instead of participation. Does that feel appropriate for your system? Yeah, I think that is great. And in fact, um, certainly considering different ways to even think about the concept itself or what it is that we're measuring. Um, and I really appreciate that and think that engagement does actually better encapsulate um, sort of what I'm talking about. And so um, thank you for that. Yeah, and I think Megan, was that Megan said, the idea of thinking about the quality of the participation. Um, I, I think that that's another important thing to, to really think about. So um, I welcome ideas for that. I use different response systems in my non-seminar courses that allow students to participate almost anonymously. It goes on with that way. They don't have to actually speak, which might make people less likely to do so. Yeah, yeah I found... Um, Lately too, I mean, one of those silver linings of the pandemic is all the different technologies um, and some of the websites and platforms that we can use to allow students engage in that way in the classroom that didn't really exist before or they weren't um, really well known. I, I will admit though, I'm pretty behind the times <laughs> in terms of catching up with some of those technologies. Um, so if you've got any to drop in the chat that worked well for you in the classroom, um, that would be much appreciated. Kat, I will share with you that we uh, tried an experiment with uh, with the old school clickers uh, at Kenyon um, some time ago, and they were the ones that had a, a you know zero through nine keypad. And what we discovered was that then this was some years ago, but when you give uh, a nineteen year old a zero through nine keypad and tell them that it's like typing in a business's eight hundred number to the phone. They, they nope. you like like you've asked them to hitch up a horse and buggy, which I guess in Knox County is not a reasonable thing that a student might know. But um. I used I used clickers for a while because that's what um, UNH had set up. Um, I did not enjoy the cost that comes for the students because they either had to purchase a phone app thing access or the actual remote which was anywhere between 30 and 50 bucks um somebody in the chat said jamboard i absolutely love jamboards um they work so good um i'm exploring socrative right now which allows students to use their computers or phones to answer questions and you can do either numeric questions multiple choice questions or short answer questions which um is something that clickers absolutely cannot uh do and then class question i think is another free one that allows for multiple choice um 
that I, I, I used in lieu of clickers for just multiple choice questions, uh, which is not as great. So I've been looking for alternatives that are either free or very inexpensive um, based on some of the student populations that I teach uh, to allow for that participation on a larger scale. Some of my courses are, I, I taught a course that was capped at 100 this semester. Uh, so having everybody have to speak up is kind of almost impossible. <laughs> uh, to, to, to keep track of even. Uh, yes, clickers, I use clickers. They, they work great in smaller classrooms. I'm afraid to try them in like a class of 60 or 70 people. Uh, <laughs> but again, those are multiple choice questions um, only. And thus far, Socrative seems to be the only one that allows for um, short answers uh, and they're free for up to like 50 people, I think. Uh, so a good alternative. I think Poll Everywhere allows for, um, I haven't oh. seen Poll Everywhere in a while, and that's another one that's freemium. I, I don't remember how many you, how much you can use them, uh, how many responses you can take. Um, yeah, 25 max audience size for the free, and then it's like $120 a year. Uh, so more expensive on the instructor side. <laughs> We've got a couple of people at this uh, conference demonstrating Slideio, which is an interesting. Uh, yeah, that was a new for me as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much.